I want to share with you a story and a video of a patient we operated on just last week in our office who had a piece of metal in his eye for 15 years. And his story is 15 years ago, he was hammering on something and felt something fly off and hit him in the eye. And when he did that, he knew something was wrong. He went to see the eye doctor then and many times after that episode, complaining that there was some piece of metal in his eye that he could feel that he remembered hitting him in the eye and passing into the eye. And when he was examined in the immediate aftermath of that accident, and every time afterwards for 15 years, everyone looked at him and said, I don't see a piece of metal in your eye. And he saw lots of really good doctors for years and years and years, and nobody could ever find anything wrong. But the patient knew that there was something wrong, and the way that he knew it was basically twofold. Number one, the eye was periodically red and irritated and inflamed and aggravated during those whole 15 years, the eye was occasionally comfortable, but it would have these flares of irritability in which the eye was red and light sensitive and uncomfortable and the patient knew that there was something wrong. The other thing that he noticed is he was developing this white spot on the cornea inferiorly where he felt like he had uh, been hit. That was the site of impact. And when he and his wife came to visit with me two months ago, they were adamant that this white spot was new that had developed over the course of these past couple of months and was getting worse. When I saw the patient in clinic, when I looked at him initially, I didn't see a problem. I didn't see any piece of metal in the eye either. But then on closer inspection, I did notice a few things that were wrong. Here at the bottom of the eye where he had that white spot, he also had a little iris defect, a subtle transillumination defect in the iris. And he had some cortical changes in the lens. He was developing a sectoral cataract also in that area. So there was good sort of incidental data that confirmed that he had had some penetrating injury to the eye in that location. Of course, he also had this very noticeable white spot on the cornea at the limbus in the location where he's reporting I was hit in the eye. But of course, the clincher was when I put a gonio lens on the eye and looked at the superior lens at the inferior angle, you could see some metallic rusty thing in the angle, which was obviously a rusted old piece of metal. Now, fortunately, he didn't appear to have any retinal toxicity. In fact, his vision was 20-20 uncorrected in the eye. And maybe this is a reason why everybody was discounting his symptoms that, well, it was 15 years ago, your vision is perfect. How big a problem could this actually be? But when we observe this piece of metal in the eye in this history of chronic inflammation and this acute instance of the cornea opacifying, we determined, of course, we have to remove this. So here the patient is in our office-based operating environment just last week. So this is a surgery we did just a couple of days ago to remove this piece of metal in the eye. And I want to walk you through the process of what we did, what we did wrong, and how we managed to get this piece of metal out of the eye. So this component of the operation, this is being done by my PA, by my physician assistant, Emma Scott. She is enormously helpful to me in all of these complicated operations. One of the things that she does is she administers our subtenons anesthesia for our patients. So here we have the conjunctival grasped using the sort of toothed forceps, and she's using an 18 gauge needle to penetrate down beneath the conjunctiva in the tenons capsule. Then she's using a 20 gauge angiocath, which is soft and pliable and flexible and she's insinuating that back behind the globe with one cc of Expirel. Expirel is liposomal bupivacaine. It's a long-acting three-day duration subtenons block. So this is a way to keep the eye quite comfortable for three days after the procedure. You'll notice as a result of that block, look how much the pupil has dilated. So that's a very effective block and it's safely rendered because it's placed with the soft angiocath behind the eye. 
See, here I am getting started with the operation. I've made a paracentesis and the main wound. At this point, I'm sitting temporarily and I'm filling the anterior chamber with this dispersive viscoelastic. And my plan is to use a gonio prism to look down at the inferior angle and to try to grab this piece of metal and yank it out using coaxial forceps. So here I am not really sitting at the ideal vantage point. You know, I'm sitting 90 degrees away from the action, but I'm just sort of testing to see what I can see. I see into the nasal angle okay, but I can't really see inferiorly. So I'm gonna move and sit over superiorly. Again, I'm gonna make a new incision. Now that I'm sitting at 12 o'clock, I'm gonna put more viscoelastic in the anterior chamber. And now I'm gonna try to figure out how to get this piece of metal out of the eye. Now, I'll pause the video here because I'm going to mention something that's not sort of conveyed here in this little edited video. And that is when I sit 12 o'clock here and I'm getting ready to put the gonio prism back on the eye to try to extract this metallic piece from the angle, what I observe to my horror is that I can't see into the angle. And the reason that I can't see into the angle is because that white metallic scar or that white scar is blocking my view. And the reason I was able to see into the angle with the gonio prism in the clinic is because, of course, you have one of those inverted gonio prisms. You look into the superior marriage mirror and it demonstrates what's going on in the inferior angle. Well, this is a direct gonio lens. And so when I try to look inferiorly, I can't see. And so now I'm thinking, well, how in the world am I going to get this piece of metal out of the eye? And this is the solution. This is an ECP probe. This is a diode laser used for glaucoma procedures to shrink and treat the ciliary body. And what's nice about this laser is not only that it provides a diode laser if you need it, but also it's got an LED light and an endoscope. And so I can see what's going on in the inferior angle without needing a gonio prism. I'm using this endoscope. Now, it's tough to use the endoscope in one hand and these coaxial serrated scissors in the other while you're not even looking through the operating microscope, but while you're looking off to the side at some 3D, at some digital monitor. So that's quite difficult to do, but after a while we get a little bit of a hang of things. One thing that I appreciate with the endoscopic view is that there are anterior synechia. The iris is a bit up incarcerated in this corneal laceration. So I'm sweeping it here, not using a cyclodialysis spatula at first. That's just a long syringe uh, with a cannula. But then after I make a little headway, a little progress, I go back in with a Barriker spatula. And you can see now that iris defect, that's where the iris was up incorporated up into this corneal laceration. And as I I make a little bit of progress, I go back in, I put more viscoelastic in the eye, I clear the blood out of the way, I see what's going on with this endoscope. I'm just checking again just to make sure that I can't see what I'm doing with the gonio prism. And no, the view is blocked. So we have to go back to the endoscope and try to make some more progress. So each time the strategy is to try to understand what's going on with the endoscope, to use some viscoelastic to clear away the blood, to make a little bit of space, and then use coaxial forceps to go reach in and see if I can grab onto this metallic rusty thing that I can see staring at me with the endoscope. And I'm using different vantage points. You know, I have this initial primary temporal incision that I made and I have another one at 12 o'clock. And so I'm moving the camera around basically and I'm sweeping from different locations. I'm picking at this little metallic object from different locations. I'm clearing the thing that my view with viscoelastic and I'm just delicately painstakingly taking my time. At this point in the operation, I've decided that my view is obscured with a little bit of heme, so I'm clearing all that out with the irrigating aspiration handpiece, and now I'm looking to see what the status of things are. Now that my view is improved, I'm using those coaxial forceps again, and I'm reaching in and grabbing, and look what I've finally managed to liberate. This brown, hard, metallic chunk, which was stuck there up in the angle. So that's it. We finally got it. This is the rusted piece of metal which was in the eye for 15 years, which was causing the overlying cornea to opacify. 
Once that's removed, I'm just once again filling the anterior chamber. I'm once again just sweeping to make sure there are no little crusty remnants behind. And the last thing I do, of course, is I use the endoscope again just to visually verify, yes, you got it all. Nothing has been left behind. We remove the viscoelastic from the eye using the irrigating aspiration handpiece, and then I provide a little bit of additional subtenons anesthesia to conclude the operation. So the reason I show this video is because the original plan that I had for treating this patient was a bad one and didn't work. And that is to say, I planned to remove this piece under direct visualization using a gonial prism. And that proved impossible because of the difference in the gonial prism operation between the clinic and the OR. Now, yes, we probably could have gotten an inverted gonial prism from the clinic and used it during the operation, but that would have been quite difficult to do things basically inverted or backwards. By far, the key to doing this operation easily was that we just happened to have the endoscope available in the clinic that day to directly visualize what was going on in the angle when we couldn't see through the cornea. So I think that that was one key to this operation, having the endoscope available. The other thing was having a high index of suspicion that there was something wrong. You know, we've all seen patients that are adamant that they have some problem and they've seen 10,000 different doctors and everybody's reassuring them and the patient is just hung up on some diagnosis and really there's nothing wrong. But there are people out there really who do also have problems that have seen doctor after doctor after doctor and and no one has figured it out yet or no one has seen what's going on. And so I think it is important to try to look at each patient fresh and not just sort of assume that you know what's going on because of what other people have come before you and said. And so having a high index of suspicion that this is a hardworking guy who has been grinding this ax for 15 years, there's something wrong to take that person seriously and to look around for a problem. There are other little things that we can recommend that have made this operation potentially easier and better for us. Using a sub tenons block, I think, is a good idea, especially when you're doing these cases in the office. You know, we've moved all of our operations into the office because we have better control. So I think that was a big component of the success. And having a surgical PA who can assist me with this operation makes my life so much easier and better. It speeds me up, it enhances my efficiency, and it makes the operation better because it allows different members of the team, me and other people, to focus intently on those things that we do best, to do our job and to work together to try to bring what we're doing to a little bit of a higher level. So I thought that this story was interesting and meaningful because we were able to extract a piece of metal that had been in somebody's eye for 15 years. And hopefully it is a little bit instructive to people who would wind up in a similar situation to us, having to remove a piece of metal and you can't see with a gonio prism. Try this ECP probe and see if it doesn't make your life better.